At the time of her sail in April of 1912, the RMS Titanic was the second of three sister ships and was the largest in the entire world. Along with her sister ship, the RMS Olympic, they were nearly 100 feet longer than the previous record holders, the RMS Lusitania and the RMS Mauritania. The Titanic could carry 3,547 people on board. Her engines were the largest ever built, standing 40 foot tall and 9 foot in diameter, requiring 600 tons of coal to be burned per day. The fanciest suites on board cost passengers 4,000 $350 to book, which is around the equivalent of $112,935 today. Even third class cabins were still such good quality, many said they were better than the conditions they had back at home. The Titanic set off for her deadly journey just after noon on April the 10th, 1912 from Southampton, England, stopping at Cherbourg in northern France a few hours later to pick up more passengers, before Queenstown in Ireland arriving around midday on April the 11th to pick up even more people and stock, before finally departing across the Atlantic Ocean en route to New York City, now carrying 892 crew members and 1,320 passengers, all unaware of their deadly fate. Despite the sheer amount of people on board, if you remember, this was only half the amount that the ship could take, but it set sail during a coal miners strike and it was just a low season that people generally weren't interested in travelling. The ship was led by Captain Edward John Smith, who was the most senior of the White Star Line's captains, with four decades experience. He had previously sailed the aforementioned RMS Olympic before taking over her sister the Titanic. Many of the crew members at his disposal weren't even trained sailors. They were engineers engineers, firemen, stokers, people hired to look after the engines or just the passengers in general. Most of them were just picked up in Southampton and didn't even have enough time to familiarise themselves with the ship itself. But things seemed bleak before the ship even set sail. Around 10 days before the Titanic set off, a fire actually began in one of the ship's coal bins and continued to burn during the voyage. The weather was mild that day but did improve from brisk winds to a crystal clear evening. On April the 14th, 1912, the radio operators on board received six messages from other ships warning them of drifting ice. It's believed that the weather caused large icebergs to drift away from the west coast of Greenland. Passengers aboard the Titanic had allegedly already started to notice it, but these were the worst conditions in the North Atlantic in any April for the past 50 years. However, despite these warnings, not all radio operators relayed them back to the passengers, but at the time this was only done as a last resort. It was always kept between the crew to avoid panic. The first warning came at 9am from the RMS Coronia which had witnessed fields of ice. At 1.42pm the Athenia reiterated the same warning causing Captain Smith of the Titanic to change course entirely and sail further south. Just three minutes after the last warning, the SS America, which was slightly to the south, reported two large icebergs, but this message never reached the Titanic, and the reason has never been discovered. Many just believe the radio operators aboard were busy trying to fix faulty equipment. At 7.30pm and then again at 9.40pm, the SS Californian reported heavy packs of ice and lots of icebergs, but like before, this message never reached the ears of Captain Smith. One final warning was sent at 10.30pm from the Californian which had stopped for the night in an ice field just a few miles away. But the Titanic's operator Jack Phillips did hear this one but reportedly told them to shut up as he was busy working. Despite the crew being fully aware of the conditions, the Titanic did not slow down, travelling at 25 miles per hour, just 2 miles per hour short of her maximum speed. This speed in icy conditions is incredibly foolish and reckless but back then it was was standard practice. They decided to literally depend on the lookouts on the bridge to spot any icebergs in time so they could avoid a possible collision. Furthermore, at the time, North Atlantic liners actually prioritised timekeeping over everything else. They were determined to stick to their scheduled arrival time, going at full speed, treating hazardous conditions as obstacles rather than serious courses of action. They believed at the time that ice wasn't that much of a risk, close calls were very common and there hadn't been any head-on collisions that actually caused destruction. A few years earlier in 1907, the SS Kronprinz Wilhelm sailed from Germany, hit an iceberg and crushed its bow, but was still able to complete the voyage. Unfortunately, the Titanic would not be that lucky. 
Most passengers had gone to bed and the lookouts were Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee. The ocean was calm, but the temperature was nearly freezing. It was later discovered that calm water is a sign of nearby packed ice, but this was unknown at the time, so there was no sign of what was about to happen. If the sea was violent, the iceberg would have been more visible, and because of a mix-up back at Southampton, the lookouts were given no binoculars. It was later concluded, however, that binoculars in these conditions would have made no difference in the slightest, as it was nearly pitch black except for the ship's own lights. Despite this, the lookouts were informed of the ice warnings, and at 11.30pm they noticed a slight haze on the horizon, but they didn't alert anybody. Some historians believe this was just a mirage caused by cold water meeting warm air, while others believe they saw the incoming disaster and simply just shrugged it off. At 11.39pm, Frederick Fleet spotted the famous iceberg, ringing the bell three times and phoned the bridge to warn officials. Word quickly spread to change the ship's course. Officer William Murdoch gave the order to hard a starboard, which would turn the ship's tiller on the way to the right side of the ship to turn the vessel left. This was common practice back then. He informed the captain that he planned a manoeuvre to swing the bow around the iceberg and swing the stern so that both ends of the Titanic would avoid the hit. But there was a delay performing the move taking up to 30 seconds for this to be done, and extra to turn the engines into reverse. Due to this, the propellers completely stopped, which affected the turning. It is believed that if the ship would have simply maintained its speed and just turned to the side, the Titanic would have completely avoided the iceberg with mere feet to spare. It was revealed in 2010 that Louise Patton claimed her grandfather Charles Lightola said that one of the helmsmen just panicked and turned the rudder in the wrong direction, while someone else ordered the boat to just continue again. Again. This was apparently kept in the dark because of possible insurance implications that we'll go over later. The ship did manage to turn in time to avoid a head-on collision, but it hit it at such an angle, an underwater spur of ice scraped the ship for about 7 seconds, dislodging upper parts onto the ship's decks. Just 5 minutes after impact, all of the ship's engines were stopped and the vessel slowly drifted south in the Labrador current. The impact was thought to have produced a huge opening in the ship's hull around 300 feet in length. However, other studies suggest that the damage left 6 narrow openings in an area, only covering around 12 to 30 13 square feet. These were gaps around 39 feet long and the iron rivets alongside the plate seams snapped off, allowing water to get inside. However, it is concluded at least that the ship was just poorly built in the first place. The covered pieces of the Titanic's hull plate showed that they simply shattered on impact without even bending. In fact, the plates in the hull where the iceberg hit were held together with mild steel rivets, whereas in the bow and stern they had double rows and iron rivets. Material scientists claimed they were near their stress limits even before the collision took place. However, it was pointed out that the Olympic, the Titanic's sister ship, was built with the same iron and she served for nearly 25 years without any incident, surviving several major collisions, including being hit by a British cruiser. In fact, she even hit and sank U-boat U-103 and her her hull plates buckled without even impairing the ship whatsoever. Back on the Titanic, after the impact, people inside the ship didn't really notice anything. Crew members in first class noticed a shudder but just thought it was normal, but those on the upper decks got the most of it. Many were awoken by the impact but weren't sure what had happened, but water instantly began pouring in, around 7 tonnes per second, which is 15 times faster than it could be pumped back out. All the engineers were now at risk as the boilers were full of high pressure hot steam and at any point they could explode if they came into contact with the seawater. Captain Smith felt the collision and was informed of the situation leading to him consulting Thomas Andrew who built the ship. They both headed downstairs to see that the cargo holds, mail room and squash courts were all flooded already. Just 45 minutes after the impact, around 13,500 tonnes of water had already entered the ship. They knew that the sinking was now inevitable, and they gave the ship just two hours to survive. The Titanic began to go down rapidly, but then the sinking did slow down again, which gave some passengers false hope that they would stay afloat long enough for rescue. Radio operators went on to call for help, but they incorrectly pinpointed their own location, directing possible rescuers about 13.5 miles in the completely wrong direction. Crew members rushed the cabins to alert all passengers of the situation, and at around 12.15am they were all ordered to put on their life belts, but many believed this was all just a joke. Some were even still playing football 
football with some of the ice that landed on the front of the ship. However, there weren't nearly enough lifeboats, just 20, as well as 16 wooden boats and four collapsible ones. The lifeboats would be able to collectively save 1,178 and nowhere near the amount of people on board, and it would have been a mere third of the passengers and crew if they had the full amount of people the ship could actually carry. But the lack of lifeboats wasn't even that uncommon back then either. It wasn't to save space or funds, the ship was built to accommodate enough for everyone and it would have cost just $16,000 to get even more. However, lifeboats at the time were for emergencies to transfer passengers to rescue vessels and therefore it was very common to have far fewer lifeboats than needed. Though some claim that they just refused to have more lifeboats as they didn't want to clutter up the image of the entire ship. Captain Smith had been sailing for 40 years and had never had any issues, but he would have been fully aware that even if the boats were all fully occupied, more than 1,000 people would remain aboard to die or to have very little chance of survival. The captain froze at this point and seemed paralysed, not knowing what to do. He ordered people to escape, but he failed to organise anyone or convey information and he never even gave the order to abandon ship. Even some officers were still unaware about the collision because of how he was acting. One officer, Joseph Boxall, had no idea about the iceberg hitting until 1.15, just an hour before the ship would sink completely. The captain didn't inform anyone that they didn't have enough lifeboats, he didn't supervise any of the escape routes and he made absolutely no effort to make sure his orders were being followed through whatsoever. To make matters worse, there were very few lifeboat exercises carried out beforehand. Only one drill had been performed back at Southampton and they were supposed to be stocked with emergency supplies but they weren't adequately done so. They were supposed to have food, drinkable water and lights but there were none found on the lifeboats during the rescues later. No other lifeboat or fire drills were carried out after the Titanic left Southampton and weirdly one was scheduled for the Sunday morning before the ship sank but the captain cancelled it for unknown reasons. There were lists posted at the lifeboat stations informing the crew of their roles, but very few seemed to read them or have any idea what they were supposed to do. Most of the crew had never worked on a ship before and didn't even know how to row a boat. Some experts even believed that it was so badly organised, even if they had the right number of lifeboats, it's unlikely they would have been able to launch them and evacuate everyone successfully due to the panic. It wasn't until 12.20am, 40 minutes after the impact, they began loading the lifeboats. An officer noticed the captain standing near the bridge and staring at the ocean in a complete trance. He shouted that they should get the women and children to safety and the captain simply nodded, but the misunderstandings grew worse when one officer heard women and children evacuation. One assumed it meant women and children first, another assumed women and children only. They would lower lifeboats with empty seats if there were no women and children wanting to board, while others allowed just a hand handful of men. The officers weren't aware of the amount the lifeboats could save, but did question lowering them with so many empty seats. If they had filled them, an extra 500 people could have been saved. Many lifeboats were lowered with 28 passengers on board despite having room for 65, and others had 12 despite holding 40. Some of the upper class passengers even refused to board lifeboats claiming that they would be safer on the sinking vessel, while others literally had to be persuaded to be taken to safety. During the panic to jump ship, engineers and firemen amazingly continued to work to try to prevent explosions in the below deck trying to rescue the ship. One man broke his leg and then died, and around 12.45am the bunker door separated and collapsed, sweeping away many in a green foam. Many passengers were injured trying to make an escape, but by 1.20am the severity sunk in. Passengers realised what was happening and families said their final goodbyes as husbands escorted their wives and children to the lifeboats. Distress flares were sent off every few minutes in hopes of attracting attention from any nearby ships. They also contacted the radio and the closest to respond was RMS Carpathia, just 58 miles away. However, she was much slower than the Titanic and even if she sailed at her maximum speed of 20 miles per hour, it would have still taken her four hours to reach them. SS Mount Temple also responded and headed to their rescue but was stopped by a huge pack of ice. However, the SS Californian, which had warned the Titanic of ice just a few hours earlier, was much nearer. Unfortunately, at 10pm, its captain stopped for the night to wait for the morning to avoid ice. And to make matters worse, at 11.30pm, 10 minutes before the Titanic's impact, the Californian's operator shut his set down for the night and went to bed. Sadly, a Titanic officer spotted their vessel around around 10 to 12 miles away. If the radio operator had stayed awake just 15 minutes longer, hundreds of lives could have been saved.
About an hour later, five white rockets exploded from the sinking ship, which was spotted from Herbert Stone aboard the Californian. He wasn't sure what it meant, but he contacted the captain who refused to do anything. Stone claimed a ship isn't going to fire rockets at the sea for no reason, but nothing was ever done about it. It was around this time the passengers knew that the ship was doomed. Some couples, however, refused to separate. Ida Strauss and her husband Isidore, who were depicted in the movie, died together. When asked for her to separate from him, she replied to her husband, We've been together for many years. Where you go, I go. They casually sat in some deck chairs and waited for their demise. Others even changed out of their casual clothes and got dressed up to go down like a true gentleman, while others just gave up hope and remained inside their cabins. Many passengers didn't even make it to the upper decks due to the maze of corridors, but the first and second class areas were cut off from the others due to the United States laws of immigration to prevent diseases. Around 1.45am the ship's electricity began to fail, lessening their chances of reaching help. Lifeboats were filled much closer to their intended capacity at this point, and the aforementioned ship designer Thomas Andrew was last Last seen in the first class smoking room having removed his life belt staring at the painting above the fireplace. But the captain's fate remains unknown. Some say he entered the wheelhouse on the bridge and died when he was engulfed with the ocean. Others believed he jumped into the water just before the bridge was submerged and died there. The ship began to capsize completely vertically. The sounds of the engines and machinery coming loose from their bolts could be heard, though others believe it was just the ship breaking apart before the electricity completely went out altogether. Passengers everywhere were clinging for dear life as the ship actually split in half before the remaining section capsized and finally dragged itself and its passengers under the ocean, vanishing forever at 2.20am, just 2 hours and 40 minutes after the impact had taken place. After the ship went under, the vessel only took about 5 to 6 minutes to sink over 12,000 feet to the bottom of the ocean. Hundreds of passengers and crew were left dying in the freezing cold sea surrounded by the remains of the ship, some of which was used to remain afloat. Some survivors described the temperature of the ocean as though a thousand knives were being driven into their body. These kind of temperatures usually result in death within minutes. Most of the people involved lasted 15 to 30 minutes before passing away. Only 13 people were helped into the lifeboats despite them having enough room for 500. Those on the lifeboats believed that everyone had gotten out before the ship had sank, so witnessing hundreds screaming and crying for their life was incredibly traumatic, and all they could do was sit and watch as many of the officers refused to return to help, most believing they'd be capsized out of panic during the rescue. Some officers even refused to return, claiming that most of them are dead already anyway. Amazingly, another rescuing lifeboat only returned once the screams for help died out. This wasn't until 45 minutes later, and most of the passengers and crew were already dead. Sadly, as morning approached, the ocean got a bit rapid, causing some passengers to fall into the ocean and then drown. Rescue wouldn't come until 4am on April the 14th, 1912 from the RMS Carpathia, which had sped through the night at high speed, risking their own safety, dodging numerous icebergs to try to save their lives. Unfortunately, a lifeboat was nearly dragged under by the rescue ship who didn't spot it. But the captain's dog, Rigel, who had escaped during the sinking, barked as loudly as he could to alert them of the danger, saving many lives. The survivors spotted the ship around 3.30am, however, were too weak to call for help. Rigel the dog was the cause of the Carpathia spotting them in time, but it would take several hours to bring everybody on board. Everyone was safely on the Carpathia by 9am. Some families were happily reunited, while others had to learn that they lost loved ones. It wasn't until 9.15am when Mount Temple and Californian learned what happened, but there were no more survivors to rescue. However, the rescue ship was bound for Austria and just didn't have the medical facilities to help the survivors, so they took them to the original destination of New York for them to be properly taken care of. The ship arrived on April the 18th, 1912 and were greeted by 40,000 people who had been alerted of the story. 328 bodies were retrieved from the sea, 119 were buried in the ocean and the other 209 were brought to Nova Scotia in Canada to be buried. Naturally, there was public outrage over the entire ordeal. Why were there so few lifeboats? Jay Brew Ismay was the White Star Chairman and Managing Director and he was able to escape, but people called him a coward for fleeing. But why was he able to get out? Why did the Titanic proceed into the ice field at full speed despite so many warnings? It wasn't until this tragedy that it was determined that the number of lifeboat ships carry is clearly out of date and inadequate. 
Others blamed Captain Smith for ignoring ice warnings and for continuing towards the collision at such a high speed, and the others blamed the Californian for not lending assistance. Despite this, the US inquiry claimed that the Titanic did all they could and followed standard procedure that wasn't previously seen as unsafe. The ship still remains to this day, though many often visit the wreckage and it will soon completely collapse and become nothing more than rust at the bottom of the ocean. But weirdly, there are a lot of other stories in regards to what caused the Titanic to sink over 100 years ago. There are a few conspiracy theories that involve people sinking it deliberately to kill off their rivals, but let's just talk about the only one that actually holds any kind of weight. The theory goes that the Titanic sister ship, the Olympic, which had a near identical exterior to the Titanic and was built in October of 1910, was damaged in September of 1911. She had a collision with a Royal Navy warship in Southampton damaging the Olympic. The Olympic, however, was deemed responsible for the collision and therefore the insurers refused to pay out for the repairs. This would also put the Titanic's completion date behind and cause more delays, causing a huge financial loss for the company responsible. The theory is that they wanted at least one ship to make some money, so they patched up the Olympic and switched it with the real Titanic. The Olympic, disguised as the Titanic, would then sail, inevitably sink and, you know, kill thousands, and they could collect the insurance money, while the real Titanic, now disguised as the Olympic, could continue and sail ahead in secret. As I mentioned before, there was a huge coal strike and hundreds were out of work and yet they still struggled to find anyone who would agree to work on the ship, which explains why inexperienced crew members were hired. But they believed these people got wind of what was done and that's why they refused to work aboard it. Some rich passengers also didn't show up on the day and claimed that it was because they were sick, but others believed they just heard what the plan was and backed out. This led to survivors' testimonies describing the ship's interiors to see if it matched the Olympic. There's even claims that the number of portholes in the side of the ship don't match what the Titanic should have had, but the Olympic. They also believe the ship didn't even hit an iceberg, but actually a rescue ship that the lookouts just didn't spot. This theory is also believed to be the reason why the Californian didn't come to their rescue being in on the plan, and it's also backed up by the belief that when James Cameron visited the wreckage for his movie in the mid-90s, you can zoom in on the ship to see an MP, which wasn't in the name Titanic, but the name Olympic. But furthermore, James Fenton worked on the ship and survived. He then claimed on his deathbed that the ships were swapped, claiming this is why nobody did anything to prevent the sinking. He claims when they got on land, he lambasted the government and claimed he heard what their plan was and knew what they did. The government then replied that if he tells anyone, he'll be locked in jail forever. Furthermore, eerily in 1898, 14 years before the Titanic ever set sail, Morgan Robertson wrote a novel called Futility, which was later changed to The Wreck of the Titan. This novel tells the fictional story of a ship called the Titan hitting an iceberg and sinking to the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. Not only are the ship's names similar, but the coincidences continue when the novel's sinking takes place in April in the same area of the ocean without enough lifeboats to save everyone. Both ships were extremely close in size, both were called the largest and most unsinkable cruise ships in the entire world, and the amount of victims claimed. Naturally, after the sinking of the real-life Titanic, author Robertson was accused of being involved, but he denied it all and claimed it was all just a coincidence based on his knowledge of ship building. So who was to blame? Was the captain just negligent and failed to fulfill his duties? Were the lookouts just not paying attention? Was the Californian just setting the ship up for failure? Was the Titanic just poorly built? Or was there a plan to kill thousands for an insurance profit? The Titanic sank nearly 110 years ago and we're still fascinated by the event and we are still seeking answers.